Okay. Yep. Okay. Oops, right there. But all right, let's get started. So today on our program, we have Miss Anjali Boyd. So Anjali Boyd is a Duke University PhD student at um, and Dean's graduate fellow in the Nicholas School of the Environment. She received her bachelor's of science in marine science from Eckerd College as a NOAA Holling Scholar. Her research examines how species interaction and physical forces interact to regulate the recovery of foundation species to environmental stressors. Anjali inspires to develop novel ecosystem-based restoration and management practices to restore foundation species worldwide. She's fiercely committed to increasing the representation of women and ethnic minorities in ocean sciences and elevating the voices and contributions of students and early career scientists. Thus far, she's served as the chair and vice chair of the Ecological Society of America's student section and an appointed member of the Ecological Society of America's Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Justice Task Force, treasurer secretary of the Society of Wetland Scientists student section, and was recently appointed as the youngest early career li liaison to the US National Committee for UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Additionally, as the director of NV Technology or NV Tech, uh, she works to combat the underrepresentation of women and ethnic minorities in STEM fields through educational entrepreneur programs to engage young children ages zero to five and K through 12 students. Anjali also serves as an elected official in her hometown of Durham, North Carolina, as Durham County Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor. So this morning, Anjali will share how marine scientists such as herself have begun to utilize sound to collect critical information about vulnerable marine systems. So welcome, Anjali. Thank you. Thank you for that awesome introduction. Yeah, yeah, you're an awesome person, so no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll go ahead and share my screen. Are we good? Can you see that? Yes, yes. All right. like you're all good. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here with me today. Um, today, I will be giving a talk entitled, Did You Hear That? Assessing and Monitoring the Ocean Through Sound. And before we get started today, I do want to take a minute to acknowledge the weeks, months, and the year we've had um, everything from the thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives lost to the COVID-19 pandemic, to the ongoing killing of black and brown people at the hands of law enforcement, to the surge in Asian American hate crimes here in America. Um, it's been a tough one, but I think we're in, hopefully ending, um, getting towards the end of some of the, you know, devastation that we've all been through. And so, um, with that, I'd like to challenge each and every one of you to take the time um, to do your research and figure out a way that you could help marginalized communities in their fight for equality and equity. And with that, I also want to wish you all a happy Earth Week and almost Earth Day tomorrow, um, which means another challenge sometime this week, try and get out into nature um, and do something to express your gratitude to the planet that keeps us alive. Um, in addition to it being Earth Week, this year is also pretty big for us um, folks in the marine science community with it being the launch of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And with this new decade launch, which will go all the way into 2030, the UN has established seven different goals for our decade, stating that we want a clean, healthy, safe, sustainable, and predictable ocean where ocean science data is transparent and accessible and the ocean science community is inspiring and engaging. And these are very ambitious goals, yet they're also very important goals to tackle because our earth is, our oceans are vast and they make up 70% of our earth's surface. And according to NOAA, um, approximately 80% of our oceans are unmapped, unobserved and unexplored, which means approximately 50% of the earth's surface we know little to nothing about. Additionally, even the ecosystems we have studied, we typically have more questions than we have answers even to this day. 
Thus, there's been a lot of interest from scientists, private sector folks, and government agencies to intensely monitor the ocean um, and collect enough data to enable us to predict future changes. And scientists have already begun to do this. We've used all types of techniques, such as collecting water samples to examine nutrients and eDNA in the water column, um, or core samples to study anything from the sea floor to invertebrate communities, as well as deploying ROVs to map the ocean floor and explore habitats that are typically hard to get to, and many, many more methods. However, what if I told you we could study the ocean just by listening to it? You probably think I'm crazy because the ocean can't talk to us, right? But it can, you just need to know what to listen for because sound is very powerful. Just think about how powerful sound is for us humans. From the music we listen to, to the noisy cities we inhabit, um, to the soothing sounds of nature, to a simple conversation with friends, all of these heavily rely on sound. And if you think about it in your everyday life, you're very rarely, if ever, in complete silence because sound is everywhere and everything makes its own unique sound. And to demonstrate this, I like to do a quick activity. Um, and so when I say go, I would like each and every one of you to close your eyes and for about 10 seconds, just absorb and be cautious to the different sounds in your environment and make note of them. Count as many sounds as you possibly can. All right, and I'll bring us back when the 10 seconds is up. And you can go now. Okay, time's up. So feel free to put your number, the number of sounds you heard in your environment in the chat. But depending on the type of environment you're in, you may have only heard one or two sounds, maybe just the fan in your office or your computer running, um, while others of us may have heard more than 10. Um, the point is sound is everywhere and sound makes its own, everything makes its own unique sound, which means sound can also be a powerful, very powerful tool for us if only we knew what to listen for. In science, sound has been used for decades, if not longer, to study and understand ecosystems, organisms, and even people. Um, for example, marine scientists have used sound to study marine mammals, everything from how they communicate with one another to their migration patterns or sonar technology um, to characterize and map the sea floor and estimate population abundance and sizes of fish. And then to most recently, something I was super excited to see was sound being used as a method for coral restoration. And so scientists um, deployed these speakers onto dead coral reefs and they played noises from those speakers that um, would typically be associated with a healthy coral reef and monitored what changes they saw. Um, and what they found was that those different, those sounds that were typically from a, a healthy coral reef actually attracted organisms um, that would typically be found at a healthy reef. So while this is no, by no means an all encompassing list, um, it does highlight the way in which um, sound has and continues to be used to help us better understand and protect our oceans. However, there is something missing from this and it's a relatively new field called soundscape ecology. Soundscape ecology or soundscape analysis allows you to spatially and temporally quantify sounds to assess ecosystems and environments. Um, and each sound, soundscape consists of about three different types of noises, each which tell us a little bit um, different things about the environment of interest. The first one is not natural non-biological noise. And this noise comes from um, usually weather events, so things such as hurricanes or heavy downpours of rain, earthquakes, wind, all of those things will be categorized in that non-natural um, noise disturbance, as well as anthropogenic noise which is us basically. Um, and so human induced noise disturbances from ships or boats, um, coastal development and things of that nature. And then lastly, but not least, biological noise, which usually comes from the different organisms that inhabit that ecosystem. Anything from whales and dolphins to our smaller critters like crabs and shrimp um, and fish. And so all together, these sounds work to tell us a pretty detailed picture of what's going on in that environment. And for the purposes of this talk, I'll be focusing on biological noise and how we used it to assess the effects of tropical cyclones on marine organisms near Tampa Bay, Florida. 
So tropical cyclones um, is kind of an umbrella term for hurricanes, tropical storms, tropical depressions, and a variety of other weather events. And they can have ruinous effects on coastal communities from flooding and damaged infrastructure to detrimental effects on marine communities. Additionally, their destructive potential, so basically um, how much damage they can cause, has been correlated with sea surface temperature. And because we're still con continuing to see our sea surface temperatures rise, scientists do believe that we will see an increase in intensity and frequency of these events, which we've already started to see if you look um, to last year's hurricane season, if you will. And although tropical cyclones have the potential to have adverse effects on the marine environment, these effects have not been well studied specifically with their implications for marine organisms. And there's a lot of knowledge gaps within the scientific literature of our understanding of what their impacts are. And so before we got super into our study, we first went to um, Google Scholar to better understand what the scientific literature said about tropical cyclones and their effects on marine organisms. Um, and we quickly noticed like two things. First, there were a limited no number of studies overall. Um, and of the studies that were uh, produced, most of them focused on habitat forming species. So things such as corals, mangroves, seagrass, um, and very few focus on actually mobile marine organisms such as, you know, fish or crabs or invertebrates and things of that nature. Um, of the ones that did focus on marine organisms, most of those also focus on marine mammals. So dolphins and whales and a few studies on shark migration patterns. Um, and so we finally got down to about 10 to 15 articles that did um, look at the effects of tropical cyclones on fish communities. Um, and to our surprise, they produce varying results on the implications of tropical cyclones on fish communities. And thus we decided that we want to focus our study on trying to understand the effect of a tropical storm on um, specifically for fish communities in Florida. Um, however, we were trying to understand like why were these studies um, producing you know, varying results. Um, and we tried to standardize for the different types of, of, um, of weather events. So things like category three hurricanes and category five or whatnot, um, that had very little effect. But we did find that all of them had in common usually was that they all use active sampling methodologies. And so active sampling methodologies are very common and have been used forever to study marine um, systems. And they entail things such as photo identification or visual surveys. Um, and unfortunately, they're not always the best to use when you're trying to understand specifically tropical cyclones because they can be weather limited. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that if a hurricane comes today, um, depending on the effects that it has on the community and the waves that it produces um, and wind conditions, it may not be safe to get out on a boat and get to that field site for a week or even a month. And that's what we actually saw with a lot of the studies that we were looking at. Um, some of them took them up to one week to get out to one of their field sites. Others, it took them at least a month um, because of the um, catastrophic effects that those storms had. Passive sampling methodologies, on the other hand, are what we decided to use for our study. Um, and this entails things such as acoustics and tags. And the benefit for this methodology is that you can collect large amounts of uninterrupted data. Um, and specifically, when you're trying to study these extreme weather events, you can really deploy your technology out into the site of interest, leave it there, um, and either it'll stop recording, I guess, when the battery dies or when you come pick it up. Um, all um, as long as you don't have like any technology failures, which can happen, but um, pretty reliable nonetheless. And so for our um, study, we looked at Tropical Storm Debbie, which took place in 2012 um, and caused extensive flooding throughout central and northern Florida, um, resulting in about 10 inches of rain, in addition to causing five casualties. Um, the storm had its largest impact on Tampa Bay uh, June 25th, 2012, which you can see with these, um, this big blob or this orange. Um, and throughout the course of the storm, we had a couple of field sites in the Tampa Bay area. Um, one was our Gulf One site, which we consider our offshore site. It was about 10 meters deep and it was a sandy bottom site. And then our Boca site was a four meter deep, shallow water, sparse seagrass bed site within the bay. 
And at each site, we had a DGS acoustic recorder deployed. Um, and so you can see in this picture, the recorders were usually tied down at the bottom with like a brick to keep them down. Um, then you have the actual recorder and a buoy to keep it standing upright. And our recorders um, operated on a 10 second, 10 minute duty cycle, which means that they record 10 seconds of audio every 10 minutes. Um, and so throughout a full day, you usually get about 144 um, acoustic files. Additionally, because of the studies that we had previously saw in the literature, um, there was a really big gap in our understanding of the direct impacts of tropical cyclones and what was happening right before, during, and after those storms. So we decided to look at data from a week before and a week after the storm, um, so June 17th to July 3rd. And then we characterized the storm based on a variety of different environmental data. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'll just be focusing on our water level data, but we did collect data on wind speed, barometric pressure, moon phases, and the water temperature throughout the storm. And once we got our recorders back and took the data off of it, um, we uploaded these acoustics files into Raven Pro to analyze them. And um, this can look like a bunch of nothing. <laughs> Um, if you don't know what you're looking for, but there's actually a lot of biological noise in this file. Um, it is a relatively loud file, but you can see different fish calls. This is a croaker calling right around here and again over here, and there's some fish calls right here as well. And so um, over the course of time, once you become more trained and identify these fish sounds, you don't necessarily always have to listen to them. You can also usually see them pretty well on the spectrogram. And so these are some of the different patterns that various fish species um, make when they're um, vocalizing. And if you're anything like me, when I started this project, you're probably wondering what in the world do fish sound like? Um, and so we have a couple of different sounds I'll play. And the first one we're gonna do is croaker. This next one is a toadfish. And then lastly, we have sand trout. Um, and so over the course of time, we've collected almost 20 different um, species vocalization patterns throughout the course of the study but those are just a couple to give you an idea of what they sound like. And so to quantify the effects of the storm, we broke the time periods um, throughout this two weeks into three different time periods. Before the storm, which we identified as June 17th to June 21st, during the storm, um, June 22nd to June 26th, and then after the storm, June 27th to July 3rd. Um, and what you see here right now um, is average calls per day over the course of the two week time period at both the Gulf site and the Boca site, as long as, as well as the water level data, um, which shows you where the peak storm surge or its largest impact was on our sites. Um, and you can see that throughout the course of the storm, especially during the storm, there was a sharp decline at both sites, but specifically that decline was a lot more prominent at the Boca site and average fish calls per day. The other thing you can see is that um, after the passing of the storm, you see this gradual increase in average calls per day at pretty much at both sites, which we believe has to do with the full moon that was approaching on July 4th. And so we did the same thing with our species data. Um, and here we were able to look at different trends that various fish species were making throughout this, um, throughout this two week time period and see how they might be differently affected by the storm. Um, and once again, this is data from Boca, and you can see that for the most part, all the fish species except for one saw a decline in fish calls, um, average fish calls per day with peak storm surge, except for our outlier, which is unknown to, who kind of went crazy during the course of the storm and was calling and vocalizing a lot more than they had prior to um, or even after the storm. So. They're virtually quiet pretty much before the storm and after, but you see this really peak in calls, which is really cool to see. The other thing you can see is croaker, um, who once again declined just like a majority of the fish species did, but then had this gradual increase in calls per, um, call, average calls per day throughout the end of the storm, which we think may have to do 
with that full moon that was approaching on July 4th. And this is our data for our Boca site. I mean, I'm sorry, our golf site. And once again, you can see golf had that decline in um, fish calls per, average fish calls per um, day. However, we do also see a couple outliers here. First is unknown one who had um, a pretty sharp increase in calls leading up to the storm, but then decreased around peak storm surge. And then we also saw this, un, um, this trend from sand trout, which was like a gradual increase towards the end of the storm, which once again could be due to that full moon that took place July 4th. And the really cool thing about um, being able to collect these big, large data sets that have like uninterrupted data is that you're able to get very granular with how you wanna view the data. Um, so what we were previously looking at was over a two week time period. And then we wanted to zoom in to that, just the during phase of the um, storm to see what was going on those four days. Um, and once again, you see with Boca, there's that decline in average calls per day. I'm sorry, hour, calls per hour um, leading up to like the peak storm surge and that persists for about two or three days before it starts to return back to normal. And with our Gulf site, while the decline, there is still a decline, um, it's not as prominent as our Boca site. Um, but the thing that we did notice about our Gulf site was that the, um, the window that they were calling in got narrower. So um, around this 52 hour mark before the storm surge, they were calling, they were typically calling for about um, 10 hours per day. While when that peak storm surge was approaching, that call window got shorter and became about four to six hours. And we did the same thing with our species data to see what those trends might look like. And once again, you see unknown two going pretty crazy during the course of the storm. And um, you see sand trout has that similar trend that we saw at Gulf where there wasn't a huge decline in um, calls per hour, but the call window did get um, narrower. So it went from about 10 hours to about four to six hours here and here. And then lastly, Croker, um, who was one of our um, top, I guess, vocalizing fish in that um, study site. And we saw a pretty big um, drop off of calls for about three days during peak storm surge. And they started to return back to normal about 40 hours after the passing of the storm. So in summary, some of the key findings we found was that there were a decrease in fish vocalizations and dolphin detections um, with peak storm surge or um, as well as vocalization patterns returning back to normal pretty rapidly, which was pretty surprising, um, but also kind of good to see. The other thing we saw within our species specific data is that it seems that different fish species are um, affected by these storms in different ways, where we saw some that were silent for multiple days while others um, who you know, picked up with their vocalization patterns during the course of the storm. And the significance of our study was that at the time when we did this, it was a year and a half, two years ago, we were one of three studies to um, use this methodology to assess the impact of tropical cyclones on fish communities. And we're today, I think one of about seven or eight studies. So there's still not, there's still a ton of research that can be done in this field. Um, and we're still the only study to be able to identify um, sounds down to the species level. And for future re um, research, we definitely need more documentation of the different vocalization patterns of marine organisms. Um, over the course of the two weeks that we were looking at, we identified what we believe 20, to be 20 distinct species. However, of those 20 um, species, we were only positively able to identify 11 of them. And so the other nine were classified as unknowns. And then also there are limitations of this methodology. And so I do believe that um, future studies should try to implement both active and passive methodologies to um, complement one another. And then a couple of the limitations of this methodology. One, the identifying the organisms <laughs> can be very hard. Um, like I mentioned um, there, we have hundreds of thousands of marine organisms in the marine environment. Unfortunately, only less than a thousand fish species have been shown to produce sound. Um, and of those, only a fraction of that um, do we have reliable documentation for what those fish sound like. Detectionability is also a concern. Um, and so, for example, imagine if I was giving this talk and there was music blasting in the background. 
it can become very, it, it, very easily, it can become hard to actually hear what I'm saying if the music is too loud. Um, and so you can think of my voice as a fish vocalizing or organism vocalizing. And you can think of the background music as um, the ambient noise that the storm produces. So when you're looking at um, the effects of tropical cyclones on fish communities, there's definitely um, some concern that the increased ambient noise would decrease your ability to um, detect those different calls. However, we don't think it was super severe in our study because we were able to find increases in certain fish species calling. And then also the absence of noise doesn't mean the absence of an organism. For example, with croaker, um, we did see them kind of go quiet for about three days during the course of the storm. Um, that doesn't mean that they weren't in the environment. It could just be that they were actually quiet, um, but it could also mean that they were not there. And the only really way to get at that would be to come, um, add another methodology to the study. So something like tags to track the fish um, would help us answer those type of questions. And lastly, our methodology simply cannot really get at the indirect effects of these events, so such as decreased reproductive success or decreases in prey population or even habitat destruction. Those are things that I think active sampling methodology are still very powerful um, to help us answer those questions. And so in the future, I think um, a combination of the two would help us better understand these systems, but also the effects of um, these different disturbances on them. I also believe that our study shows yet another way that sound can be used to help us understand our oceans and provide insight into other potential applications of acoustic. Um, everything from examining the effects of extreme weather events on marine organisms to monitoring and study, studying systems that are um, not easily accessible, such as hydrothermal vents or um, things that have low visibility, such as maybe a monkey seagrass. They can also be used, acoustics can also be used to help us collect large continuous data sets on marine communities to help us understand community composition, life cycles, and more. And last but not least, I believe acoustics can be a very powerful tool to help us um, predict um, if a system is becoming more vulnerable or there's being changes in those systems. So an example of that is water quality. We often um, assess water quality to see how these different systems are doing. I think acoustics could be a similar used in a similar way. Um, if we collect these large data sets and have an idea of what a typical soundscape is like in a specific environment, um, we can more easily be able to identify when things are changing and how those changes might affect other um, parts of the system. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, as well as my family and friends, my undergraduate advisors, I'm in my alma mater, Eckerd College. And I can take any questions you all may have. Okay, there we go. All right. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Anjali. Um, so we do have some questions uh, for you. So I'm gonna pull yeah. them up really quickly. Uh, but one of the first questions that we had um, was basically kind of along the lines of, have there been any known sounds from um, any ocean organisms that have potentially left the water that have that can be heard above the water? Um, I know I've not heard of that, but perhaps since you're a little bit more on the ground with that, uh, you might have more answers. Are you saying or that you could probably hear like in an acoustic recorder, like out of the water? Is that what you, the question is getting at? Um, I think it's more of like, is there a way that um, if an animal makes a sound that it can leave like the water column and be heard? Oh. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's- I would imagine about. so. I mean, well, whales and dolphins can be pretty loud with their calls. Um, with regards to fish and some of the smaller organisms, I'm not totally sure. But um, I, yes, you can definitely hear some things from land that um, some of the noises that are going on um, under the water. Okay, because it's actually funny. I went whale watching not so long ago, and they put a mic under the under the water. Yeah, they could. And, and yeah, you could hear like. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, so cool. Depending um, on but, how close to the surface it can be, you can probably pick some of that up um, from a boat or something. But yeah. for those for these fish species. Mm, 
I don't know. It depends. It, maybe. I'm not going to say they can't, but I haven't um, seen it. Yeah, I've never quite heard of that one either. That would be a pretty easy <laughs> example. <laughs> um, right. Another question that we had um, was basically what's the importance of the full moon? I know you were mentioning that a lot in your mm -hmm. uh, presentation, um, but some people yeah. were curious. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so some fish species, um, as well as other marine organisms, have, inhabit, have a habit of vocalizing a lot more closer to a full moon for reproductive reasons, um, mating, and all of those things. Um, however, the fish species that we think that might have had an effect on, there hasn't been previous as evidence to suggest that they um, are on these lunar cycles. Um, so that's why we're saying that it could have something to do with the full moon, but um, we would just need more research to know if the, these species actually do call more during a full moon um but yeah okay okay so basically kind of it has potential impacts on like what they are doing and what they're talk talking about correct <laughs> yeah talking about yeah no they do talk um but yeah it definitely does okay Ooh. um another question that we had um was basically like, would you happen to know what the, I guess the loudest sound in the ocean might be in terms of, you know, biologically? Because, I mean, I know we talked about whales a little bit already, but is there um, a, have has there been any studies done on any animals that make like the loudest sound um, that's most like uh, most recognizable? I'll, I can tell you from my experience, and I think a lot of, people who do sound stuff will agree, snapping shrimp are very loud. Um, and <laughs> they make a lot of noise on, on the recording. They can usually drown out the sound of actually fish and even dolphin calls and stuff like that. So um, if you ever have a chance to just Google a video of a snapping shrimp, they get very, very loud. Um, so that's probably one of my biggest ones that are super loud. Uh, okay, okay. I would have expected like, you know, the whales and dolphins which is why I said that, but that makes sense as well. I've heard, you know, <laughs> that, but, um, uh, know whales, whales might have them beat. I, I don't personally do a bunch with whale acoustics. So I'm not a, a expert at that, um, but snapping shrimp are, are super loud. Um, I definitely think they have dolphins beat. So, yeah. Okay. All right. A shrimp beating a dolphin. Okay. In terms of sound, <laughs> that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so another question that we have is basically just how much does physical oceanography like ocean currents and seasonality and et cetera impact the audio recordings that you guys collect, uh, kind of like differentiating different sounds and stuff like that. I know you mentioned it before in terms of the storm, um, but what about other factors as to how you kind of separate those? Yeah, um, so the other, there's definitely, um, I think some of the biggest impacts on your ability to detect, especially biological noise, um, most time it's actually anthropogenic noise, like shipping ships, boats and shipping channels and whatnot, they actually make a lot of noise that can really drown out um, a lot of the biological noise you might hear in a spectrogram. Um, so one of the ways to combat that is to do a third octave analysis. And it's basically where, um, I, I, we did do this for the study, I just didn't present the data, but you can basically group different hertz of sound um, and then measure like what that sound looks like. The downside of that is that you can't really, I, you won't be able to look at the like species specific trends. And so um, while that can tell you like if certain levels are going up or down, it can't really tell you like, is it a croaker? Is it a snapping shrimp? Um, that's where you need that spectrogram. Um, but when you're doing a spectrogram, if you have a bunch of like shipping channel noise and stuff like that, as you just kind of have to scrap the file, there's really no way. There's a couple of ways you can clean it up a little bit, but it can be pretty much, you know, that data can really get overshadowed pretty easily. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Um, and I guess it kind of goes along into the next question a bit, um, although you, you might have halfway answered it a bit, but. Um, Another question is basically, is there is there less biological noise in areas where human sounds are prevalent? I mean, obviously, if you have like boat sounds going on and, you know, there's no way to hear anything else, then you're not going to be able to get that information really. Um, so that might skew into that question a little bit. But, you know, just 
curious overall, is there generally a consensus that like in areas where human sounds are prevalent, you are, there's basically less sounds to hear in general, or is there any sort of, I guess, yeah, is there any sort of consensus on how that works? Yeah, that is a really good question and an area that needs to be explored a lot more in detail. Um, however, the idea is yes, that um, there has been some other studies with like oyster reefs that have found that um, oysters actually won't settle in places that have a lot of ambient noise or a lot of human induced noises from shipping and stuff like that. Um, so that's an area that's like wide open for discovery. Um, but I would hypothesize, yeah. Um, and I think NOAA actually is doing some work on is doing a really big soundscape project with some of their marine sanctuaries um, where they're trying to assess, compare and contrast the different areas of their sanctuaries that have a lot of anthropogenic noise or human induced noise disturbance and how that um, affects their different sanctuaries and stuff like that. So um, in theory, yes, we need more evidence though. So. Right, right, just needs to be looked into a little bit more. Somebody will get exactly. on it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, Another question that we had was basically someone wondering if you know of any other studies that are looking into how to these sounds are impacting our aquatic creatures. Um, and if we could potentially use the disruptive noises to work on creating new policies around requiring like fire, quieter boat motors or engines, things like that. Um, you know, have there been yeah. any recent or current studies on that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And they're doing some really cool work at Scripps um, along those lines. Um, specifically, this big project with NOAA that I just mentioned um, is focused on trying to, the, the, I guess the problem is that we, soundscape is, ecology is a really new field in the marine environment. Um, we've used it in terrestrial systems for a while, a lot longer than we have in the marine environment. And so we don't really have the baseline data yet, which is that project that NOAA has going on to try and get basically map the soundscape of the various marine environments that we have um, to then be able to say like, hey, this has this environment has way too much anthropogenic noise compared to this one and what can we do? So um, I do see the policy coming down the line because of involvement with organizations such as NOAA, um, but I think we're, we're still working on it. And there's a bunch of people at Scripps who are focusing specifically on ship noise um, and making sure shipping motors quieter and things of that nature. Yeah, because they're very, very loud. And I, <laughs> for studies, it's kind of a nuisance. And also for, you know, just the, the biological presence there, you know, it probably can disrupt a whole host of different things, I would imagine. So mm -hmm. exactly. Makes sense to do some more inquiry, inquiry on it. Um, but just a <laughs> A personal question for you. Um, do you have a favorite sound that you hear from any specific kind of fish or one that's really rare? Um, um, yeah, there is this one sound. We weren't able to identify it to species level, which was kind of sad. Um, I think it was classified as like unknown mm, four maybe. Um, and we called it a hurricane because it made like the sound that it made look like an actual hurricane swirling on the recorder. Um, so that was probably ended up being one of my favorite sounds that we um, found throughout that experiment. Can, um, sorry, can you repeat what you called it again? I, I think you missed it. Yeah, hurricane. We called it a hurricane. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, because okay. it, it looks like a hurricane and the spectrogram, if you look at it, it looks it's swirly like a hurricane. Um, and it makes like a whistle sound, which is really cool. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, last or close to last question. So, um, we had someone ask, what can, I guess, we potentially do or a community do uh, to help protect the marine environment? You know, is there something, um, any initiatives that we as just citizens can take to be like, hey, you know, be cognizant of this thing, this is an issue? Yeah, um, a bunch of things. I think on a person level, personal level, um, Outside of sound, plastic pollution is a, a really big threat to our oceans right now. And so um, finding ways to limit plastic use is always helpful. But on um, a sound level, mm -hmm. if you can afford it, you know, get some uh, quieter boat motors, um, always <laughs> helpful. 
Um, but also be sure that you, um, when you are boating or out in the water, that you're in areas that you are supposed to be in, right? Because we do have sanctuaries and places set up um, to limit uh, human-induced noise disturbances. And so falling by those rules um, is always helpful. Okay. Um, and then I just had one last question myself. Um, in terms of groups of fishes, is there any, um, I guess, is there any issue isolating like, okay, this is a single entity or this is like, a, you know, or this is a whole collaboration of fish, you know, because when you have schools and stuff, I'm sure that they're all making lots of sounds uh, mm -hmm. together. Uh, so is that ever an issue or can you just be like, oh, okay, this is this kind of specific type of fish and there's just a lot of them all together or does that ever come yeah. up as, a, as an issue? Yeah, um, they, they often do call at the same time and so they can overlap um, with when they're calling. Um, so that that's actually very common um, because a lot of them, um, especially the more common ones actually call on the same time, which is when people are less active. So it's usually like peak morning hours, like 6 a.m. or something like that. Um, so yeah, it is pretty common to have them overlap and not be able to count individually, specifically like which one was which, but you can hear them and then record it usually. Okay. And then uh, also mini side question for me, um, mm -hmm. which was, uh oh, sorry, get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was it? It was, um, basically, oh yeah, this is kind of a fantasy question. Um, but is there any indication as to, um, I guess, translating or trying to figure out what these uh, different types of fish are saying to each other? I mean, it, you know, I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everybody's interested in it, but I think it'd be super interesting. Um, the real cool thing about fish similar to like uh, marine mammals is that they don't just have one call. They have multiple different types of calls that they can make. Um, so understanding what, like if certain calls are used for, for reproductive, reproduction, other ones are maybe used more for foraging, um, others maybe more community, I don't know. But yeah, that, that would be super interesting <laughs> um, to, to look into if we could get that data. Yeah, while you were going through your presentation, I was like, I wonder what, you know, you were like, this species, you know, was really loud during the hurricane. I was like, I wonder what was going on. And I just had, I had a scene exactly. from like Finding Nemo in my head. Or it was like, calling, <laughs> like, where are you? Like, I'm trying yeah. to find you like during the hurricane. So I was just, I was curious if there had been any sort of studies on that. Like, you know, what are these fish saying exactly? Um, yeah, they're. They're, I think they're working on, hopefully they're working on it. Maybe I need to help out, but um, yeah, it'd be really cool to understand what they're trying to, um, what they're using different vocalization patterns for. Yes, that would be really cool. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, folks, if you guys have any other questions or anything that you want to ask Angeli, or if you want to keep the date um, with what's happening with us, follow us on social media. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash Smithsonian SMS. And our YouTube page, if you would like to watch this again, or if you missed it or you know friends that missed it and want to watch it, um, go to our YouTube page. It is youtube.com slash Smithsonian SMS. So yes, once again, thank you for sharing your time with us, Anjali. It was a pleasure having you. And I'm super happy that I was able to get you on. Um, <laughs> And thank you yeah, for having me. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And also thank you as well for, um, you know, your, your beginning statement um, with everything that's going on. Very, very important, so. Yes. <laughs> we are I not just like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, yeah. But thank, thank you all, have a great one. Yeah, you too, take care. All right, bye.